And when I was growing up, uh, I used to read a lot of books that had titles like, you know, the Rockefellers or the Kennedys, these sort of multi-family, uh, multi-generational, sorry, multi-generational family stories that, that allowed you in specific and human ways to, to um, learn something about the passage of the American political economy through generations. And at one day, I was just uh, walking along and thought I should do that about the bin Laden family. And um, I thought as well that the family was the right unit to write about the Saudi political economy, because it really is the only important unit in, in the Saudi political economy. And so I, I hoped over the course of several generations within a single and consequential family to, to write about Saudi Arabia. So that was one of the purposes of the book. A second was, based on my own travels in the kingdom and in the Gulf uh, outside of Saudi Arabia, my people of my generation got to know our peers. And, and there was increasingly a sense uh, in, in my own experience that that this was a really remarkable generation of young Gulf Arabs who came of age during the oil shock period, during the 1970s, the period of the oil boom. And they uh, essentially grew up in the midst of an extraordinarily uh, rapid and pervasive transformation in their own societies and cultures. And they became pioneers of globalization in many ways, without a lot of guidance about what they should be um, pioneering for or in and, and where and, and how. And so there was, a, there was an experience of identity and, and modernization available in that generation to which Osama bin Laden belonged and to which his brothers and sisters belonged that uh, interested me. And, and the thing that was frustrating as a journalist about writing about Saudi Arabia, it's such a difficult place to work. You came informally to know something of the texture of this narrative, but it was very difficult to translate it into journalism in the conventional way. And I thought that perhaps uh, a deeper narrative of the family story and a narrative of the diversity of choices and experiences within the generation of the family to which Osama belonged would provide uh, at least some of this texture that, that I thought I'd gotten to know informally. And then finally, my third sort of purpose with this project was to try to reinterpret Osama uh, as, as a member of his own family and as a Saudi, as a Saudi dissident, as first as a Saudi subject and then as a Saudi dissident, and to really think about him um, without um, ignoring all of the previous interpretation of his life and radicalization in the context of the Afghan war and in the context of post-79 transnational Islamic radicalism, but to add to that something that had been harder to, uh, harder to get at uh, for, for a lot of us who had been working on him. I, I had written my first story about Osama bin Laden in the summer of 1993 after the first World Trade Center bombing when he was in Sudan and we were starting to get a glimpse of this sort of rootless uh, transnational Islamic radical movement to which Ramzi Yusuf seemed connected. It wasn't a, a sort of e Dr. Evil financier sort of story. It was just an, it was an attempt to portray some of the loose diversity of transnational Islamic radical figures, and he was one of them. And so I, I've been trying to reinterpret him ever since and imagine I'll stay with it as long as there's fresh information. So the narrative then, to go back to my uh, Rockefeller's Kennedy's model, is really a a, a narrative of generations, and particularly two generations, the, the generation of Osama's father, Mohammed bin Laden, and then the generation of his 54 children, of which Osama was one. And what I uh, discovered in looking for the most important figures in those two generations was a streak of charismatic genius, really, that begins with the father and is passed through to his sons in particular because as an Arabian patriarch he paid uh, a lot of attention to his sons and virtually none to his daughters. But this streak of charismatic genius, this way of living, this way of leading, this way of creating uh, in his life was a source of great achievement and ultimately a source of great wealth for the family. And then it was handed down a generation to uh, some of his sons who were equally gifted, 
but who were growing up in this very rapidly transformed post-1970s world that I referred to before. And, and, the, and you see the streak of charismatic genius sort of slightly distorted, like light passing through a prism, and it reaches each of his talented sons in a, in a slightly different way. It's still present, but then it, it sort of changes its, its spectrum and its, and its effects. And I, that's what I thought I would try to talk about a little bit today specifically through the lives of three bin Ladens uh, who are at the heart of this narrative, Muhammad the father, his eldest son, Salem, who became the patriarch of the family after Muhammad died, and then Osama, who uh, collaborated with Salem and then was set adrift by Salem's own death, and uh, after uh, Salem's death became um, the most notorious member of the bin Laden family, if not the family's leader. So Mohammed bin Laden was born in the Hadramaut, in, in what is now Yemen, um, in the early years of the 20th century. Nobody knows exact dates in Arabia, even as late as uh, the 1950s and 1960s. It's very rare to come across someone who knows their true birthday. Generally, people know their, their uh, year on the Islamic, year of birth on the Islamic calendar, and perhaps an Islamic month. But we would guess that Muhammad's uh, birth was uh, in the first, um, around 1902, 1904. And I don't know if any of you have ever been to Yemen. I had the pleasure of going there to research the family's history. But it was, it, it was in those days, the Hadramaut, about as remote a place in Arabia as you, as you could find. Even the British Empire, which controlled the coasts uh, from uh, Makala and um, uh, Aden, uh, didn't bother to come up to these drought-stricken canyons where the bin Ladens were from. And uh, the uh, story of the Hadramis, uh, which is worthy of its own scholarship, some of which is, I think, conducted here, is uh, one that's really neglected in the West, but very well known in Arabia. The, the, the people to which Mohammed bin Laden was born, the people to whom the bin Ladens belong, are an, an extraordinary diaspora of global travelers who have sailed seas and served in Islamic armies and, and run governments as far away as Indonesia and Malaysia and, and who had, at the time of Muhammad's birth in poverty in this uh, drought-stricken canyon, a global network uh, that, that looks uh, very much like the global networks of better-known diasporas, the overseas Chinese, uh, the Jewish diasporas, uh, and had similar uh, characteristics of being able to take advantage of their global networking to uh, conduct business, to trade, uh, to, to build mobility for their own um, uh, clansmen. And so when Mohammed bin Laden, Osama's father, found himself essentially orphaned and impoverished at about age seven, he uh, went with his younger brother through local trading networks, cotton dealers and slave dealers who were living in this canyon where there were no schools but hundreds of mosques. Uh, he went with his brother on a walking trip out to the sea. They boarded a ship and they sailed initially to Ethiopia where he worked as a young boy, as essentially a child laborer. The family oral history is, diverges a little bit as to whether he was working in a shop or on a construction site or whether, and he lost an eye at the age of eight either because an iron bar fell and hit him in the eye or because a shopkeeper he was working for threw some keys at him and struck him and he lost his eye. But in any event, he came back to the valley, uh, had a glass eye fixed, and then at about age 14 or 15, he traveled again with his brother with no adult supervision. They walked on a journey that they would then recount to their sons as a sort of a magical journey inflected by religious intervention. They would be lost and and God would light up some field full of watermelons, and they sailed on ships around the Red Sea, and they ended up in Mecca, uh, and, and then in Jeddah, the gateway to Mecca, the, the port city of uh, Saudi Arabia that was uh, essentially a tourist and, and hospitality town for the, for the annual Hajj uh, pilgrimage. So uh, Mohammed bin Laden arrived there at age 15 or 16 with no uh, education, no ability to read or write, and uh, some loose contacts from his Hadrami network. He got himself a job initially um, carrying luggage at the port. He slept on the ground with his brother on pieces of cardboard in the sand. And uh, he arrived there essentially just in time for the Great Depression, 
when the global Hajj trade is collapsed and uh, what modest local uh, hospitality economy there was began to suffer. Nonetheless, between his arrival there in the late 1920s and uh, the end of the 1950s, uh, Mohammed bin Laden, through his own charisma uh, and his own ambition and drive, which he had sources of inspiration for back in the valley when you went out as a Hadrami and made a fortune, you usually came back and built a showy house with your, ex with your repatriated dollars. Uh, so there were models of, of success and ambition, people who had made great fortunes in his isolated valley. And for whatever reason then, inspired by those examples or by his own vision of what was possible, he started into the building trade and he learned how to be a mason First, uh, they used not so much brick as coral and, and uh, sort of a, kind of a mud brick material. Uh, he taught himself how to be effective. He made himself into a small contractor. When the Americans came into Saudi Arabia in the 1930s in the guise of Aramco, what became Aramco, to start uh, looking for oil and, and funding the king of Saudi Arabia, he uh, actually got a job for a while during the Depression with Aramco. Uh, which was looking for small contractors and builders who had talent. They singled him out as he was someone who could, who could make men come together on the job and, and who uh, had leadership qualities. They gave him the facility to start a small business. He did so. And then after the Second World War, when Saudi Arabia really began to boom and finally the seas opened and it could export the oil that the Americans had found and developed but not done much with, uh, Mohammed bin Laden essentially ingratiated himself with the Saudi royal family, made himself indispensable to them uh, as their personal contractor, the builder that would work in the Saudi style. When Saudi Arabia began to boom after the Second World War, a lot of international construction companies, particularly American ones, came in essentially and said to the king, let us build your kingdom, because no, no such place existed. The, the Saudi Peninsula had not been conquered by any empire. The Ottomans had run around in a few oases. The British occasionally sent emissaries to the king on very brief trips to try to prevent the Turks from uh, causing trouble. But it was essentially a wasteland that nobody wanted to trouble themselves with. The exception was the area along the, the Red Sea, the Hejaz, that had been part of the Ottoman Empire and the British and French and Germans had competed for it in various ways, but this was an extremely underdeveloped part of the Middle East at the end of the Second World War. There were no roads, literally no roads. There were uh, very few port facilities, there were no formal airports, uh, there were no telephone, there was no telephone infrastructure. And so Bechtel came in and uh, started receiving contracts, you know, cost plus 7% or cost plus 8% to start building the basics. Uh, the cities and the, and, but the, but the Saudi royal family, as they began to receive these subsidies from the sale of oil and the discovery of gold and other things, uh, they, they, they really didn't focus so much on building a national infrastructure. They also wanted to build uh, palaces and they wanted uh, the finest uh, luxuries that they could find. The, the oil companies would take the princes, in particular the sons of Abdulaziz, out to the west and try to impress them with the dazzling prosperity of New York at the Waldorf Hotel or Paris. And you know, surprise, surprise, these young men would come back having never been out of Saudi Arabia, never read anything other than the Quran essentially. And they'd come back and they'd say, well, I'd like a house that looked like the one you showed me. And, uh, you know, and Bechtel would be sort of say, well, that's not really what we do, but uh, perhaps this uh, gentleman, Mohammed bin Laden, can help you out. And uh, at, at a, at, you know, Bechtel would start building roads and uh, they'd bring in all this uh, construction equipment, bulldozers and graders and that sort of thing. And uh, then they'd get a call from the local prince in Jeddah. And you can see all this back in the State Department correspondence and in the old uh, corporate correspondence that I was able to, to find. And they'd get a call from some prince who would say, uh, I know you're out on the road working there with your, your grader and your bulldozer, uh, but my, my refrigerator isn't working. Uh, could you send someone over to fix it? Or, um, my air conditioning seems to have stopped. Well, that's because there's no electricity grid outside of your palace. And so as Bechtel got frustrated with this style of doing business, at a certain point in the 1950s, they essentially decided life is too short to work in Saudi Arabia. And they, uh, against the pleadings and the begging of the State Department, they said, we're, we're going off to Lebanon or other places where we can uh, work in a more normal fashion and make some money. And as they, Pulled out of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Laden was essentially at the port 
waving them goodbye. And he essentially in, became the indigenous sole source contractor for all of the construction because he was able to work in the idiosyncratic style of the Saudi royal family. If uh, you needed something done at midnight or three in the morning, if you didn't have cash for another six months, if you wanted to trade land for a palace, if you wanted to trade a farm for a palace, uh, he was open to your, uh, to your possibilities. And he had this winning style of working with diverse uh, networks of laborers and engineers and accountants. And by the 1950s, he had a procurement office on Broadway in New York. He had American accountants and engineers. He had Italian uh, road engineers. He had German partners. He was building a global company before anybody was really talking about these things in the Middle East. He was, in many ways, a modern man, even though he uh, was also a very Arabian man. He was the first private citizen in Saudi Arabia to own a, an airplane. Uh, he brought in American pilots and uh, got to know uh, American culture through his friendships with those pilots. Um, at the same time, his idea of being a big man in Saudi Arabia was inspired by the example of the Saudi royal family as well as the, as the sheikhs he had known back in Hadramat. And so he met, married many, many times. He married about two dozen times. And between uh, the mid-1940s and, and the mid-1960s, he fathered 54 children. Now, uh, one of those uh, sons uh, came along in about 1958. And there's been some discussion in the attempts to construct Osama's biography about the birth status of his mother as a factor in his alienation or his radicalization. And I think um, in my own uh, research and conclusion was that this uh, is myth and not, uh, not the truth about the childhood that Osama knew. The way Muhammad um, uh, managed his household was that he had uh, two uh, senior wives uh, who, to whom he remained married for many years and with whom he had um, five or six children each. Those senior wives lived on his uh, compound and uh, uh, though they enjoyed uh, a sort of status that, that they seemed to um, exude in relation to younger wives who came and went, uh, under Islamic law, they had no special authority or any special status as, as, as shareholders of his firms or as potential heirs to his wealth. And Mohammed bin Laden was, though not political at all, a very devout Muslim who uh, lived his life by the letter of Islamic laws as well as the, in, in his attempts to find the spirit of it. And so he uh, interpreted Islamic law as providing permission for him to marry serially as long as he treated his ex-wives fairly, as the Quran prescribes, there are some passages that, that prescribe the way you're, you're meant to treat your former wives. And so he um, married and divorced uh, these other two positions, in effect, of the four wives uh, that uh, at least Saudi Islam interprets as permissible. He, he kept two of them essentially as, as rotating uh, positions. And, um, and many of the uh, women that he married, and this was not unusual at the time, but it's still quite striking, uh, were essentially children. I mean, they were very young women, 13, 14, 15 years old, who were given to him uh, in what were um, indirect sort of transactional settings, where he would come into a remote part of a seer, for instance, to build roads and, and uh, uh, defense facilities. And in order to get the job done, he needed the cooperation of local independent tribal sheikhs. Well, he'd go to those men and then he'd say, uh, look, let's make an arrangement. Your sons want work. I can pay cash. Uh, you send me 50 people out to the road for the next 18 months. I'll make you deputy engineer. And, uh, and somewhere along the way, somebody says, well, wouldn't you like to marry into our family? And so uh, then presented as a young woman, 13, 14, 15 years old. And, and he would often uh, marry and divorce those women without any record of those marriages occurring. But if they became pregnant and bore him a child, uh, the record shows that he fully recognized their rights under Islamic law, treated all of the children as legitimate. And the point is that Osama, whose mother was a 14 or 15-year-old uh, girl in a, an impoverished area of Syria where Muhammad was traveling on business, who was essentially presented to him, and the record suggests that there were some employment for the men and the family and some other things. But she traveled off with him, uh, gave birth uh, uh, and, uh, to Osama, uh, was divorced by, by Muhammad shortly after she gave birth, 
And then he arranged for her to be remarried to a mid-level executive in his company uh, who had a salary. Uh, and uh, she then spent the rest of her years, she's still alive, in Jeddah in a monogamous relationship with this new husband. They had five children and they lived essentially a suburban life in uh, Jeddah. But if you can imagine young Osama without laying him down on the couch, uh, the circumstances of his earliest years. His mother is 14 or 15 years old. She's essentially given away by her parents in Syria. She follows this businessman who's about 50 uh, on a journey into Saudi Arabia around to various job sites. She becomes pregnant. She gives birth to a child. Uh, the, they, the two of them are on their own, essentially. Uh, he then divorces her and hands her and the child off to a new husband. She goes into that marriage at 16, 17 with this son in her arms. And you can imagine the intensity of feeling that must have been present between the two of them. I don't think you have to do too much more guesswork. Uh, it, it's, how that played out in their lives is unknowable, but the, the intensity of the experience is easy to see. And then in the new family, you have this dynamic in which the stepfather uh, is a source of stability, by all accounts, very gentle man, good man, all the neighbors liked him. Uh, they had a, a, a normal family, they had a television, they watched westerns and bonanza and other things. But uh, in this family, the Osama is literally the golden child, because as a uh, legitimate son of Muhammad under Islamic law, he is automatically a shareholder in the company, so he's getting massive amounts of dividends from a fairly young age, and he stands to inherit uh, a very large fortune upon Muhammad's death. And, but for him, the family really doesn't have any of this status. The stepfather is an employee, and, and Osama is the source of capital in the family. And so he, he certainly grew up as a special child. A sense of specialness and intensity surrounded him from the beginning. That's about as much as we can see from the outside. Uh, that I try to provide more in the, in the narrative, but that's the essence of it. In 1967, Muhammad bin Laden was flying. He, he had built uh, the bin Laden company into essentially the Halliburton of Saudi Arabia. They were the sole source, no bid contractor for all of the sensitive defense projects in the kingdom. And in the 1960s, there were many of these because Saudi Arabia was essentially at war with uh, Egypt's, uh, Nasser's Egypt, which had occupied parts of Yemen and was attempting to overthrow the Saudi royal family in the name of Nasserite socialist revolution. And the United States and Britain came in co quietly, covertly in many cases, and helped Saudi Arabia build defenses along its southern rim, where nothing existed. So they built garrisons and missile bases and air bases, and, and essentially King Faisal, uh, who was the king uh, at, the, at this time, and who was the only sort of progressive, modernizing king that Saudi Arabia had during this period, uh, he worked with Mohammed bin Laden as the only contractor on all of these projects because it was just easy to do business with them. They didn't have to haggle. There were no contracts. Everything was just on a handshake. And Mohammed bin Laden had this ability to organize massive amounts of labor and just get the job done. It was not, he had an intuitive feel for engineering, but he was not a professional builder. He just had a gift for organizing and bringing people to a job and sticking with it and working until it got done. And he had a very intense work ethic. Well, in 1967, he was flying to one of these job sites down in Asir where he had all of this work going on. And he had an American pilot uh, who was a veteran of the United States uh, Air Force who had just come into Saudi Arabia and was flying a Twin Beach aircraft. And they were landing at a dirt strip that was just marked by stones on a slope in a bowl. And the airplane, and Muhammad always sat in the passenger seat with a little cup of coffee. And they talked in Pidgin English and Pidgin Arabic as they went out to these job sites. And the plane was coming in. And uh, there was a gust, a crosswind that came up. And the plane, uh, the, the pilot tried, I think, to pull up and go around was what the investigators determined. And he stalled in the way that he tried to pull up. And the plane fell to the earth. And in, uh, on a September day in 1967, Mohammed bin Laden died instantly in that plane crash along with his American pilot and everyone else who was aboard the plane. He left uh, 25 sons and 29 daughters behind. The eldest of those children, well, the eldest of those sons and virtually the eldest child, his sister was a little bit older, was Salem bin Laden. Now, at the time of his father's death, Salem was in prep school in England, and he was playing in a rock band called the Echoes. Uh, he was uh, a, a recipient of this streak of charismatic uh, genius that his father possessed, but he ended up 
from the time of his father's death when he was about 21 years old uh, until his own death, um, living in a way that um, uh, is difficult to describe in a short period, but I'm going to try. Osama was a rock and roll musician, a pilot, an adventurer, a businessman, a traveler. He spent uh, time in the United States and England as much as he did in Saudi Arabia and Lebanon and the UAE. He uh, ultimately owned property or spent time in Texas and Orlando, Florida and California. He was a very skillful uh, pilot. He also had an intuitive talent for business and people, uh, but he uh, lived uh, very large uh, from the time of his father's death. He returned in his uh, blue jeans, uh, smoking his, his little pipe, it was the 1960s, uh, taking some of his band members. One of his band members ended up marrying Emmylou Harris. They were, there were some people who had actual talent in the band. He wasn't particularly one of them by the accounts of his band members, but he was very enthusiastic. And uh, he loved to be around rock and roll musicians and pilots. And he essentially organized his life as a traveling party uh, with Learjets and uh, Gulf Streams and, and uh, Hawker Sidleys in, with this big rolling party of, in, of American and European, Swedish, German pilots and rock and roll musicians. If you could play drums and you could fly, you could go anywhere with them. You would go skiing uh, one day to Paris, shopping the next day to nightclubs in Copenhagen the third day. Uh, let's go to New York. He had an apartment on Fifth Avenue and he uh, would stay there for a few days, then fly down to the estate that he had outside of Orlando, which was called Desert Bear, about 10 acres with a lake, and it had ultralight flying planes, and he'd fly around with his friends. He was a very uh, spirited, playful character. He, had, he was a very American character in my own sort of uh, uh, parochial perspective, because he, he, lived, he lived very freely on his own terms, and he invented his own life as he went along. He was also very egalitarian, a Bedouin characteristic, but very egalitarian in the West. Uh, one of my favorite stories about him is he would, he would go out. Uh, one of his, his gifts was his ability to disarm the CEOs of Fortune 1000 corporations who by now were coming to Jeddah to do business with the Bin Ladens in the context of the post-1970s boom. There was so much money to be made. The Bin Ladens were a natural partner for a lot of corporations, and they had deals with with Volkswagen and, and uh, Porsche and soft drink companies. And so all of these CEOs would come in to meet Osama and, and he would uh, use his, his way of living. He would generally meet them only while he was lying in bed. Uh, he would uh, force them into sing-alongs and sing parties. His favorite songs were um, On Top of Old Smokey and various corny songs. I, there was one story where the CEO of Bell Canada came into Jeddah for a big this is the biggest telecommunications deal ever in the Middle East. He flies into Jid expecting to, to ink it. Uh, he's picked up at the airport, brought out to Osama's house, I mean to uh, Solomon's house in, in Jiddah. And uh, Solom has a big party organized. And before they sit down to business, he, he decides that they'll, they'll all sing Frere Jaca together. And the CEO of Bell Canada will lead the French uh, portion. And so he has to do this for And then by the time you sit down and negotiate with him, uh, you're not really sure where you are or what you came to do. And, uh, but he was, a, he was a very egalitarian character. He wore blue jeans and t-shirts when he traveled in the United States. He didn't take limos. He rented economy cars. He drove around. He liked to fly everywhere. He didn't really have, he hated Palm Beach. He preferred Panama City, which, as you know, is uh, best known as the Redneck Riviera of uh, Florida. And uh, my, my favorite story about this part of his uh, personality was that he was at a dinner with a CEO at a restaurant in, I think it was in New York, and uh, somebody served a bottle of wine. He drank lightly, but not, uh, not generally to excess. And uh, somebody served a bottle of wine, and, and the CEO uh, was the taster and disapproved of it and made a big show about how this was an insult, this bottle, and sent it back. And uh, Solom got up and uh, said he was going to the men's room, and he, he went back into the kitchen, and he found the waiter. He said, give me that bottle of wine. Uh, give me this empty bottle. He took another bottle, emptied it out, poured the other bottle into it, <laughs> had him recork it, bring it back out, serve it again, and of course the CEO said, oh, this is what I was talking about. This is so much better. <laughs> and uh, Solom exposed him, and then, and then they didn't, they didn't uh, do much business together. Uh, 
he, um, he, had, uh, he was married and divorced, and uh, in, the, in the sort of a slightly reinterpreted style of his father, he uh, had a number of girlfriends in, in the United States and uh, Europe simultaneously. They, were, they weren't known to one another, but he didn't have, he wasn't really in serious relationships with them, so I don't know what the sort of social contract of their relationships were. But one day, uh, he invited four of them uh, to his estate outside of London called at Offley Chase. And uh, he sat them, they didn't know of each other's existence, and they sat them all down together, one American, one French, one German, and one English. And uh, he said, you know, in my country we have, uh, under Islamic law, a man is, in, is entitled to have four wives. And uh, I, I have a dream. My dream is inspired by the United Nations. I would like to um, ask you all to become my wives. I love all of you uh, equally. And uh, what I'm going to do is to build a compound in Jeddah. Uh, and at the entrance to the end, four very large houses. You'll each have your own house. And at the entrance, there will be a United Nations flag. And then at your house, there will be a flag from your country. And uh, you'll have uh, servants and You'll each have a car from your own uh, country of origin. And uh, if you read the book, there's a quite a charming uh, on-the-record interview with the American woman who was in the room, who's, who I really uh, enjoyed. She was 22 and living large herself at the time. And she just recalls thinking to herself at that point, I don't want a Cadillac. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then he said, is there, they, 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 there was sort of a, well, I don't know, a couple of them were sort of, this, I don't, this may be not the worst thing I've ever heard, it's not exactly what I was looking for. And he said, well, okay, you know, I know this seems like an outlandish idea. Um, if you try it for a year and you're unhappy, uh, uh, you can leave no, uh, no hard feelings and I'll give you $100,000 in a house in your country of origin. So... Um, a couple of them wavered and said, well, I don't know, what do you think? And, uh, uh, but uh, one, uh, the German woman walked out immediately in tears and, and was devastated, and the, and the English woman um, ultimately married him uh, alone. Uh, and she, uh, Caroline Crary, is the daughter of, uh, of uh, English aristocracy, still a, still a member of the bin Laden family. Um, in 1988, uh, oh, so, so Salem, I, you know, I knew when I started this project that there would be contrasts between Osama and some of his westernized brothers. I mean, as a researcher, Salem just turned out to be the gift that kept on giving. He was, his, uh, the, the juxtaposition between his choices and his search for identity and the style of his life uh, and, and that of Osama was, you know, a very uh, powerful source of uh, specificity in the narrative, I thought, as I was researching it. But what was most remarkable and most rewarding of all was that during the 1980s, uh, Osama, who I'll come to in a minute, uh, who was an extremely religious priggish uh, person, really couldn't have been more devout in comparison to Solomon's um, uh, choices. Uh, he and Solom were collaborators. Uh, they were comfortable in each other's uh, company. And in fact, uh, Osama, uh, Salem was the principal arms supplier to Osama during the 1980s when he was fighting against Soviet occupation in Afghanistan. Now, at that time, everybody was on the same side. Osama was not in direct contact with the United States, but he was aligned with the general policy of the United States. He had contacts with the Pakistanis, and he had close contacts with the Saudi royal family and the Saudi intelligence service, which was running the Saudi part of the Afghan war. And for, if you think about this uh, history of being the sort of Halliburton of Saudi Arabia, it was entirely natural and orthodox for Osama to represent the bin Laden family, the bin Laden construction company, and the Saudi government on the Afghan frontier. He was carrying out another sensitive defense project on a no-contract, uh, no-bid basis, and doing the right thing. And Salem uh, was aligned with that business model, too, because keeping the royal family happy in the era of King Fahd and the era of Western travel and, and hedonism, that was his job that following on his father's uh, version of it. And keeping Osama happy and in the front as a representative of the pious side of the family was good business for Salem. So Osama would uh, ask for, for weapons and, and uh, publicity and funding, and Salem would fly in on his private jet with his shaggy-haired American rock and roll, Swedish rock and roll fans and friends and, and co-pilots. 
And I had always wondered after working on this very hard in the Ghost Warriors research, as what Americans had Osama ever met in his life? Had he ever met any Americans? Because I'm, I'm you know, I think all of my efforts uh, to answer that question have led me to believe that he never met an official of the American government. He was one degree separated. In policy terms, it probably doesn't matter that he never met an American, but it's, it's interesting he never met an American. And uh, then on the course of this research, I learned about uh, a, a man named George Harrington, who was a salesman of ultralight aircraft in San Antonio, Texas, who'd never been out of America, and who saw him, walked into his store, bought all of the inventory in the store, and said, oh, by the way, come on out to the airport, I'm going on a trip. He ended up in London and in Austria on New Year's Eve singing House of the Rising Sun at Adnan Khashoggi's private discotheque. Next thing he knows, he's in Dubai, hot air ballooning. Next thing he knows, he's on a plane flying into Karachi, and then one day Asylum comes into the hotel room, the Karachi Sheraton, and says, oh, uh, I gotta, we got to take a day trip tomorrow. i got to go see my brother Osama. So they fly up, and they get off the plane on a dirt road, and, and there's George Harrington of San Antonio, Texas, uh, shaking hands with Osama and uh, sitting there while his brothers confer in Arabic for three hours. When I finally tracked him down in Houston, because most of the people I interviewed for this book had never been interviewed by anybody in the media, I knocked on the door at 9 in the morning. And uh, you know, you know, it's hard to be a, report, a street reporter these days because nobody likes the media. And I've learned that you, can't, you really can only go at the beginning of the day when people are too tired to be overtly hostile. And uh, <laughs> so I knocked on the door at 9 in the morning, and the door answered, and I present my card, and I get my rap. You know, I'm Steve Colm, research a book about the bin Laden family. I'm thinking this is the home of George Harrington. I understand he may have known Osama bin Laden back in the other. And she listened to me for uh, 45 seconds, and then she paused, and she said, George, somebody's here about the Bin Ladens. And uh, when I came in, he came to the door. I gave him the same explanation. And he looked at me and he said, I've been waiting 15 years for you to arrive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure he thought I was the FBI. He was too confused to. Uh... But anyway, it was an entirely innocent encounter, just an example of all of these crossed wires. There was another scene in where uh, Sodom actually flew Osama out to the, to the Dorchester Hotel in London and uh, to sell him to put him together with some German arms dealers who he had met through his uh, rock and roll pilot friend from Stuttgart. And uh, they brought these guys in. And Osama was in one room of the, of the suite, and, and uh, Salem and the other guys were in the other room. And uh, they're going into the meeting, and Salem says to his friends, they're all chain smoking cigarettes as the 80s. You know, they all got long hair and beards. His, his always present was his Swedish mechanic, Bengt Johansson. And uh, so Solomon turns to Bankton and he says, look, I, I should have told you this. My brother, he's really, really, really religious. So put your cigarettes out, no jokes, treat me like a shake, like I'm really somebody, and we'll be out of here in 45 minutes. I mean, that was the way that, they, that he dealt with Osama, but he actually passed quite a lot of uh, material help. So let me just finish by talking uh, just uh, for, for five minutes about Osama, and then I'll take your, your questions. So Osama... Uh, reached his choice in response to all of these opportunities. Because, you know, keep in mind, I mean, Solomon was the leader of the family. He was the patriarch. All decisions flowed through him. His wealth was more or less unlimited. But his brother's wealth was still pretty considerable. They were all getting allowances in the neighborhood of four, three to 400,000 tax-free dollars a year in the 1970s. And, uh, money that was then supplemented by salaries if they worked in the family business, as Osama did, dividends from successful projects, and so forth. So they had enormous wealth. They were a family of pilots. They could fly everywhere. They, they, they were from a diaspora that originated without recognition of borders, a truly global family. And this generation that I referred to earlier that grew up in the 70s, they essentially could go out and purchase any identity they wished. And some of them did that with relish. Some of them, uh, like many people that you know in the West, made one set of choices about their identity when they were young and then made another set of choices when they were middle-aged, maybe went back towards their origins and towards tradition as they age. In each of the stories that I was able to find a, a sense of, there is a different pattern, but it's a, a familiar one. And then on the extremes of, of different choices purchased with this great wealth, you had Solomon on the one hand and Osama on the other. And Osama, unlike um, some of his brothers, did not go abroad to uh, prep school as an adolescent, though he did go uh, briefly to a Quaker school in Lebanon as a younger child. 
But after his father's death, he enrolled at the only international, modern, uh, professional uh, boarding school in Saudi Arabia, one that had been organized by King Faisal and was essentially run by British and Irish uh, teachers along with Egyptian and Syrian teachers. And uh, it was in Jeddah, and it was, it was a boarding school for some and a day school for most, and uh, Osama was a day student. And uh, in a pattern that's really quite familiar in Muslim Brotherhood influence areas of the Gulf, uh, he was singled out as a son of an elite family by his Syrian Muslim Brotherhood exiled uh, physical education teacher and recruited into an after school study group uh, where he was uh, indoctrinated into uh, essentially it was just religious studies at first but it had an, a political spin as it deepened which is the Muslim Brotherhood sort of recruiting uh, pattern and at a certain point along the way uh, Osama was uh, identified in this in this after school study group as as a true adherent and and he got a lot of attention and he converted and became a Muslim Brotherhood activist in his high school uh, in the days when there were sort of two cliques at his prep school there were the Muslim Brotherhood influenced or Salafi influenced religious activists and then there were the Nasserite leftist revolutionaries and they used to shout at each other and debate and uh, Osama became more and more ardent and I think the point I would just make about his radicalization, and there's lots of interest in his radicalization and the path by which he ends up, uh, you know, authoring millinery and violence. But, you know, he was for most of these years in high school and in uh, Afghanistan and on his visits home back and forth between Afghanistan and Saudi Arabia. He was working for his family company. And I think the, the, the point I would want to impress uh, upon you is that he was an entirely orthodox figure in this respect. There was nothing radical about him in a Saudi context in those times. Yes, in the bin Laden family, you know, he was a bit of a nudge. He was a little severe. No one could understand why he insisted on going to the mosque every single time and why he was so unforgiving of uh, people who would uh, uh, you know, not wear the dress that he thought was appropriate and so forth. But even there, he was not, um, he was not, he didn't hit anybody with sticks or yell at them. He just was quietly censorious and very righteous. And, you know, you can imagine a teenage uh, uh, zealot uh, of that sort and, and the way that he's uh, impressing upon his family members the example of his own piety. And that's who he was. But he was an entirely, there was not, no one was thinking around, uh, is this guy a, a radical or is he headed off in some radical direction? In the, in the context of public orthodoxy and public religion and the marriage of the state and Islam and Saudi Arabia, he was a model citizen in many ways. He was literally a model citizen. And when he went off to uh, Afghanistan in, um, to fight the war, he was doing the state's business um, with that, uh, that very much in mind. You know, I'll just finish with an answer to a question that I think I started out uh, asking uh, very briefly to myself at the beginning of this project on the, in that part of the project where I was hoping to reinterpret Osama. And the question I always had in mind is, in what meaningful way is Osama thought of as a, best, best thought of as a bin Laden, as a member of his own family? What are the characteristics of his leadership, his innovation, his, his uh, success, his uh, radicalism that are traceable to the inspiration or example of his family? I think there are three answers to that question. Uh, above all, there are others. One is that his father taught him how to lead diversity. You know, Al-Qaeda uh, essentially succeeded where many other like-minded terrorist or radical groups uh, failed because Osama was able to gather and hold together over a long period of time an extraordinarily diverse following, not just Saudis and Yemenis and Egyptians and Palestinians and Lebanese and Moroccans and Algerians, but also Nigerians and Sudanese and Indonesians and Filipinos and Indians and Pakistanis. And he there was, I think, inspired by the example that he witnessed many times of his father's own style of leadership. These work camps that his father assembled on these road jobs and construction jobs look a lot like the diverse camps unified in the name of Islam uh, that Osama built in Afghanistan. And, and uh, so I think that there is a comfort that he always had with uh, language, origin, race, and ethnic origin that just is not common uh, among uh, Arab radical leaders, um, never mind Saudis who have a reputation for being particularly um, xenophobic, to put it generously. 
Um, and so a second uh, way that I think he's meaningfully a bin Laden is that he embraced confidently early on and in an in innovative way the technologies of globalization. Uh, Al-Qaeda succeeded because bin Laden was early to see the power of satellite television as a way to evade the authority of Arab regimes because he was making YouTube-style fundraising videos with his brother's help, big, bulky, handheld cameras 20 years before YouTube existed. He grabbed the web as soon as he uh, saw it. He understood that uh, communication and technology and mobility uh, were more powerful forces in the world that he was rising in than borders and states. And uh, ultimately, 9-11 uh, was his demonstration project of that uh, insight. Even though he wouldn't articulate it the way I do, I do think that is very much the pattern of his success, innovation, and his vision, too. And then finally, he was, he was a bin Laden because he was a brand builder. He was a marketer. His, he worked as a uh, junior executive in his family company right through his 20s. He had ambitions in the company. Uh, he was uh, not a senior, but he was very active in comparison to some of his brothers. And the bin Ladens were essentially uh, gateway brand marketers into Saudi Arabia, and they uh, learned how to build advertising and promotional campaigns. In fact, Osama's uh, eldest son, who has returned to Saudi Arabia, now runs an advertising agency in Jeddah, uh, that I visited uh, while he wasn't there one day during my research. Um, it's called Fame Advertising. And uh, it, it ha looks like a Silicon Valley startup. It has pictures of San Francisco, Golden Gates inside. It's next to a Starbucks and a, and a Gold's Gym uh, on Palestine Street in uh, Jeddah. And uh, I took his brochures away, and one of them um, uh, advertised their, their approach to special events and big, you know, big bang marketing and that sort of thing. I mean, it was astonishing. So uh, the next generation of bin Ladens uh, may be even more interesting than the last couple. Thank you very much for your attention. So we have 15 minutes for questions. We have to end this session early uh, to be able to get Steve back on a train to Washington after dinner. So we do have 15 minutes. So the floor is open, and I'll let him call uh, people. Yeah, I, um, I guess this one I started um, summer of 2004 and I finished in the end of 2007. I usually work about three three year cycles. And um, this one was, a, I, I don't think I've ever had so much fun reporting uh, since I was just getting started because it was such a journey of discovery. It was all over the world, literally, and uh, so it was um, a lot of travel, but uh, so much of the interviewing I did involved, as I said, people who you, not officials, not people who are used to the media and, and who had stories to tell and, and just being lit up by particularly those who wanted Solemn to be remembered in all of his fullness. Um, he left behind many friends and, and uh, many people who were loyal to him and many people who had known him and then been stunned by 9-11 and then had to, had to reinterpret their own experience with the family. And so I was very fortunate to come across people who had a lot of pent up uh, stories to tell, but it was it was a real joy and a privilege to work on that book. Yes. Yes, uh, there are uh, other characters in the book that I think you'll enjoy if you uh, uh, take the time with it. It's, uh, but they they basically they're. You know, the, the brothers in particular, and there are some sisters that I was able to uh, bring to life. You know, everybody in that family is a pilot, for example, and he had a, a sister. Uh, Sodom had his favorite sister named Rhonda, a singleton sister whose mother uh, had married his father in Egypt and who he sort of discovered after his father's death in sort of less than comfortable circumstances, and he sort of adopted her, and, and he wanted her to be a doctor. And he uh, sent her off to, and a pilot, those were his two goals for Rhonda. And uh, so he sent her off to uh, Florida, put her up at Panama City at the Marriott in, uh, at the East Bay, and, and got her pilot's lessons there. And, 
and then he centered a medical school at uh, uh, University of Cairo and then in Montreal until she got her medical degree. And uh, when she was getting her pilot's license in the United States, she had to, in order to get a pilot's license, I guess, this is not something I know a lot about, you, you have to do a cross-country flight solo um, with minimal navigational aids. And so she was doing this and Salem had some premonition, he was very worried about her and he tried to get the teacher to sit in the plane with her. The guy said no, he wouldn't do that because it would cost him his license, but he would fly behind her in case something happened. Well, as she was going along, uh, smoke started filling up in the cockpit inexplicably and she had to put the plane down in an emergency in a field in central Florida. Salem was beside herself. She did it successfully, uh, walked away from the crash, and then uh, Salem organized a party that night at the Breakers in Palm Beach and flew everybody they knew in from Texas and New York and hired a huge band. They went all night and then the next morning they literally they went to Disney World. That was how they celebrated. Anyway, Rhonda uh, <laughs> lived in um, uh, Jeddah uh, for many years and was a doctor, had her own uh, pediatrics uh, practice there and was much, much liked by uh, people who knew her and uh, she actually passed away from cancer last, um, uh, earlier this year. Yeah, I think your I mean I think your framing is right. In Western Europe you have a generation of youth who are sort of structurally displaced in the sense that they're from country A, they're living in country B, but they don't really feel a part of country B and there's you know so there th that that sense of structural displacement seems to surround many of the experiences of radicalization that that we're familiar with there. In the Gulf it's very different because there you have um, an environment of public orthodoxy in which, uh, particularly in Saudi Arabia, you know, a, a, an apolitical but deeply uh, pious and, and devoted religious right, religious life is not an act of opposition to the state. Uh, to the contrary, it's a, it's a form of affiliation with the state in Saudi Arabia. And yet there is this pattern of Muslim Brotherhood activism that has influenced uh, stories, narratives of radicalization within that orthodox environment that is very specific and I think very common. I, I remember, I mean, if you, if you go to Kuwait or the UAE or, or Saudi and you um, meet middle class parents, I mean middle class, not you know, the wealth, super wealthy um, civil servants or journalists who I would come in contact with, they um, worry about their adolescent sons at 13 to 15, the way American parents might worry about uh, you know, gangs or drugs or something of that sort. I remember having dinner in Kuwait one night, a guy pulled over, father pulled over a newspaper, Arabic language newspaper, he said, look at this ad. It's a, it's a recruitment ad for a camp for uh, learning how to write Microsoft software. And he said, now if you're uh, thinking about you know, what your sons are gonna do for a living, that's a very, it's, it's, it's reduced tuition, eight to 10 weeks, uh, and he said, only if you are in the know do you know that that's a Muslim Brotherhood camp and that you get an hour of windows and then six hours around the campfire singing songs and reading hadiths about revolutionary activity and the overthrow of your parents, which is part of the kind of narrative of radical recruitment in many of these networks. So I think Osama's story, uh, though it's peculiar and it's, uh, uh, it has idiosyncrasies because of the bin Laden family's relationship with the royal family, Nonetheless, it's part of this very gulf-rooted pattern of recruitment. I remember shortly after 9-11, uh, a bunch of uh, the family members were sort of pissed out of the United States. Did you have any uh, information about what, why, and so forth? Yeah, there's a, there's a chapter about it in the book. Um, I guess if I tell you that, then you really won't have to buy it. But. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's a pretty good story. I was determined to find something new about that uh, flight and I ended up uh, getting to the bodyguards who were aboard 
Um, and the story they tell of the atmosphere aboard the plane and the actual experience of the bin Laden family members is, is much more interesting than the kind of false narrative of, of collaboration about them getting out, which is filled with myths and I don't really think in the end uh, matters very much. But the, but the actual experience of who those bin Ladens were, what they were doing in the United States, they were obviously at that point, Osama had already declared war on the United States. So if you were one of the generation that was still coming vacationing in the States or living in LA, as one of his sisters was, another pilot uh, who was living out in Westwood, and uh, you know, they, these were the people who had decided they were gonna live this affiliation even though their family name was uh, made presenting credit cards at, at uh, department stores uncomfortable. And, uh, and then something that even they uh, hadn't in their worst uh, case imaginings. But, this, but this, the whole farce of getting them out on this plane, it was a sports plane that had been used by the Chicago Bulls and the Baltimore Orioles. The, at, at a certain point, they picked up this woman in Los Angeles who was a pilot, and she was weeping and, and really distraught. And uh, she, they, she was the only passenger on the flight from LA to Orlando where they were gonna pick up another big group. So this bodyguard, goes up to the, to the cockpit while they're going cross country and, he's, and he starts talking to the pilots and he realizes the pilots don't know that these are the Bin Ladens that they're flying. The pilots say, well, we're just picking up a bunch of college students, right? And we're flying and then we're hopping from Orlando. And he said, and the, the bodyguard decides, well, I really don't want to be, I don't feel like it's a good idea to withhold information from the pilot in this environment. It's like, you know, 10 days after 9-11. So he tells them, and, the, and everybody on the crew then starts going ballistic. You know, they, they, they say, we're not flying, they're staging a strike. They say, we're putting this plane down. They land in Orlando, and they say, we're not going anywhere. And then, then, they, then they talk and confer among themselves, and they say, well, we're not going anywhere unless you pay more money. <laughs> so they had this big negotiation about their fees on the, on the tarmac, and, and one of the brothers comes out in silk suits, and he's standing trying to negotiate with these pilots, and, and uh, Anyway, it's a very funny story, but it's very poignant too when the family starts coming aboard from one stop to the, the other. It's this kind of mournful, intense family reunion. A lot of college students, everybody's chain smoking, everybody's nervous, a lot of people in tears, and, and a couple of the college students complaining to the bodyguards, you know, they'd just gotten their fake IDs in Boston, and now they're going home to Saudi Arabia, not going to do them any good there. And so, <laughs> so very, uh, yes. Uh, this is an incident in December 2001 where Osama was thought to be on a mountainside he was under heavy bombardment. He eventually escaped. It's probably the best chance that the United States had to capture him after 9-11. Um, and the question was, why didn't the United States deploy the 10th Mountain Division, which was then, I think, in Uzbekistan, and was trained for altitude fighting as essentially a rear blocking force because the weakness of the Pakistani blocking force essentially allowed Osama to escape. Uh, you know, Frank says that it was his responsibility in his memoir. He says that he recommended against it. He was the regional theater commander. He was the commander in charge of the operation. His uh, reasoning was that he was afraid that American soldiers set down right in the middle of Pashtun country just as the government was falling. It's a complicated uh, context, but he was afraid that they, that they would destroy the successes of the fall of Kabul and stimulate a Pashtun uprising. Um, that was probably the advice that he was getting. There, were, there was a lot of advice being given to the Bush administration, including to Suncom, by uh, Afghan specialists. I uh, wouldn't have been one of them, but others. Uh, it was a reasonable belief, but it turned out to be a wrong belief that uh, the Pashtun sort of sensitivities in this were so acute that if you, if you deployed American forces into their territory at that time, that you would stimulate a, a revolt, a rebellion, just when everything was going well. And that, that was the reason the advice was given. There's a gentleman behind you. Last question. Yeah, in the blue shirt and red top. Yeah.
Yeah, I think um, it happened in stages between his return from Afghanistan in 1989 and his uh, forced departure from exile in Sudan for Afghanistan in 1996. So that seven-year period is where he went from being an orthodox hero of the Saudi uh, foreign policy project in Afghanistan to um, a, a, de a declared enemy of the Saudi state and a declared enemy of the United States. And along that pathway, uh, one turning point was the rejection of his advice by the Saudi royal family after Saddam invaded Kuwait. Another turning point was his own uh, estrangement from the Saudi government as, be as he began to join a dissident movement of Saudi religious radicals who believed that this, the Saudi royal family was not sufficiently Islamic in its conduct of uh, uh, its portion of the, of the state, of the government. And so he, he started to put his toe into that dissident movement, and then the more he started to write, it, it created an, an accelerating um, alienation, and finally uh, the Saudi government uh, burned his, you know, tore up his citizenship. And then finally, as to the United States, when he was forced out of Sudan, he correctly understood that it was American pressure that forced him to leave Khartoum. And while you and I might not choose that as the first place we would move for our next job, it's actually in comparison to the Afghanistan that he ended up in, it was a very comfortable place for him. He had a, a nice house with its own mosque. His family was with him. He had air-conditioned offices. He was running a business. He had farms. He had horses. Uh, from his point of view, uh, he had it all in some sense. And he was ambivalent about how much he was willing to risk if he was going to have to give up his family and his, his offices and his being a big man around town on Fridays. And, and uh, the Americans essentially decided that their policy uh, required that Sudan force him to depart. And so he ended up uh, being forced to go back to Afghanistan, which was in the midst of a terrible Taliban-run civil war. He got there. There was no electricity. There was no, he didn't really have great contacts when he arrived. He had money, and he had his own little militia. But he went up on a mountain that first summer when he arrived in Afghanistan and wrote a declaration of war against the United States, which seems pretty good evidence of how he was feeling at that point. Thank you.